Steve. How you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Good. Good to see you. Same. Same. Yeah. Long time. <laughs> Great. Well, first of all, we we'll thank everybody for coming out and uh, through the traffic. And uh, where does there's a, a little Wayne and Drake concert nearby? I, I heard he's going to stop by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe we'll see. It's Steve Blanket here, so yeah, you never know. <laughs> but uh, Steve, thank you for this opportunity. Really appreciate it. Glad to be here. Yeah, good. So I want to dive right in some questions, and then we open up the Q and A to the audience. So um, your icon, uh, your impact on entrepreneurship. You know, not just entrepreneurs in the valley, but across the world. You know, your essays, your books, lean startup. Uh, for the audience, I know everybody pretty much has done their homework on Steve Blake, but hear from you just about your journey from, you know, as you know, from military to entrepreneur to now. And so the short version is. Uh, I did eight startups in 21 years, uh, four IPOs, but more importantly about holding startup is two craters so deep, uh, one of which left an iridium layer, uh, uh, meaning it was a pretty massive failure. And uh, when I retired uh, in the last bubble, I actually spent some time thinking about success and failure in entrepreneurship in Silicon Valley, and uh, had a heretical thought, which was uh, we had been essentially lied to for the last 50 years from investors on how to build their early stage ventures. To make a long story short is that the model for venture capital at the time was that startups were nothing more than smaller versions of large companies. And that everything a large company did, we were going to manage our startups to go do. Large companies wrote business plans and therefore we made startups write business plans. And large companies wrote five-year plans and we were going to make startups write five-year plans. And, um, I decided that uh, on reflection about thinking about not only my success and failure, but by then I was sitting on boards of public companies and private companies, realized that that's not how likely the world worked, is that you know no business plan survives first contact with customers, and that success and failure was actually very different. On a personal level, uh, you know, it's uh, it was kind of amazing, is uh, I see now students uh, starting companies in their 20s or earlier, but I took a path, as you mentioned, from the military to a series of apprenticeship jobs, essentially, learning from others. And it took me 10 or 15 years before I was, you know, running or even a co-founder of a company. So um, I kind of learned by doing it. I wasn't as smart as, as my, even my students are today. Yeah. I don't know if that answered your question. It helps. It helps. It helps. So, so with the state of entrepreneurship, how have you seen it change from over the last, you know, five or six years in terms of, you know, I mean, you teach at Stanford and so forth, yeah. So a couple of things, and in fact, this really is a uh, convergence of a series of both happy accidents and some of which not so accidents. Um, one is, and it's almost heretical to say this inside of Google, but um, Amazon Web Services as a utility for computing uh, changed the nature of uh, the cost of doing a software startup almost by a factor of a thousand. It's kind of hard to imagine now, but when I was an entrepreneur, if you wanted to do a startup, you know, the first thing you needed to do was buy a mini computer or, you know, or maybe later on a series of distributed sun workstations. And you needed to reserve a budget of a couple million bucks for hardware and software licenses. And so that immediately set the startup territory into a crowd of professional investors which happen to sit in entrepreneurial clusters like Silicon Valley or if we were doing life sciences in San Diego or maybe Cambridge or Massachusetts. Um, and that kind of changed with the fact that the cost of entry was dramatically different. It also changed the nature of venture capital when in fact uh, now all of a sudden, you know, a couple hundred grand to start a good early stage venture. It doesn't mean that it's all that's required, but the funding strategy <coughs> And then maybe the third piece is the stuff that I started and Eric Reese and then Alexander Osterwalder, this whole lean startup movement kind of demystified this process of what it exactly is it that you're supposed to be doing in the first year or so of a startup. And if you remember my story about it, I think we got it wrong, was understanding that what people were teaching us was that startups were small versions of large companies, but actually inventing a language that says the distinction was Large companies execute known business models. That is fancy word for saying large companies, well, they know who their customers are. They know what products they want, what features they want, what pricing is, what competition is, and how to create demand and partners and all that other stuff. The sum of which, which is, we now kind of know is a business model. But we were confusing that with a startup. Um, a startup doesn't execute anything. 
you might think you are, and you might confuse your passion with execution, but actually a startup is searching for a business model. Mm -hmm. and this was a big distinction between search and execution. The other distinction was is we've built tools for execution for a hundred years in these things called business schools. And a business school is an artificial construct. The first is a graduate school with Harvard in 1908, which said, well, wait a minute, the U.S. needed a cadre of uh, administrators for corporations. The U.S. had gone through its industrial revolution, and management was now separate from ownership, and we needed a professional management class. And by class, I mean, for, you know, kind of a layer that never existed before, and there was no professional training. So what happened was business schools emerged to kind of train masters of administration, Big idea, not masters of startups. The assumption was we needed people to run these existing companies. And so Harvard and others kind of very quickly put courses into strategy and tactics and you know, supply chain and operations theory and whatever. And that's what we had till like the end of the 20th century with very little theory on, well, how do startups work? And it took me a while to understand that the mistake that had been going on is you know, business school professors, with maybe Stanford and some at Harvard as an exception, if you ask them, well, what do entrepreneurs in a garage do? And they would say, Steve, I'm like providing strategy and tactics for companies with 20,000 people. How hard could two guys or women be in a garage? You know, they use the same stuff. Not one of them ever have been practitioners, understanding that it was very different when you were in the garage than when you were in a large company. So there were simply no management tools at all for searching for business models. There wasn't even a language. And so the first book I wrote, Four Steps to the Epiphany, kind of said the emperor had no clothes. It basically said, this is a mistake. We need to invent a set of tools and language to describe what is it that early stage entrepreneurs need to know how to do. And that was the beginning of the lean startup. And so what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> it's about how different, but that's great. That brings me to my next question about the Lean Startup. Because uh, in a previous conversation we had actually at a, another event, we were talking about how like investors uh, should now ask the entrepreneurs like, to see their business model canvas so forth now. Uh, so with that, uh, how do you suggest founders go about you know, now really leveraging the business model canvas, leveraging the Lean Startup movement prior to pitching to investors? So it's very funny, you know, this whole lean startup thing just started like when I kind of called she's expecting bullshit on like what we were doing before. And so just as a reminder for you know, anybody who's like been on Mars, the lean startup is now the buzzword du jour of Silicon Valley, but there real really is some meat behind it. And the the lean startup says, look, uh, we can now make a company much more efficient in terms of your energy and time and money invested if we actually separate out your passion and your vision from realizing that while you think you're a visionary, the data says and the odds say you're actually hallucinating. <laughs> and, and, and so the goal is how to turn what essentially is, which is a startup, a faith-based organization, exactly a religious organization on day one, into a fact-based organization as quickly as possible. And the Lean Startup is nothing more than a series of tools that efficiently do that. Let me explain the tools first and then we can answer your question. One is a way to organize all the pieces in your head of what it is you're doing and why are you doing it. You know, in the old days, we'd say, go write a business plan. And the business plan would be some narrative and it would be a five year. Anybody ever write the income statement, balance sheet, cash flow, and a business plan? Anybody ever do that? Do you know that no one ever noticed the, in a startup, unlike a large company, everything you put in that five year plan is a series of unknowns? Mm -hmm. Do you realize the only people who required a five year plan to, for a series of unknowns were venture capitalists in the Soviet Union? Mm -hmm. um, and we know how well that kind of turned out. For, you know, this side is laughing, but this side is like looking at it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we need simultaneous translation over here. All right, you guys pretend to like I'm saying something interesting or ask them. <laughs> so, so let me say this. So, Soviet Union, all right, venture capitalists. Um, so, so, you know, the. The real surprise is a startup is a series of unknowns. And so we wanted to come out with a way to kind of frame these hypotheses that make up your passion. Gee, I want to build X and it's going to solve the world's problems. 
okay, so let's kind of break this down. It's, you know, what's the value proposition, which is a fancy word for, you know, what are you building? You know, what's the customer segments? Who are you building it for? Okay, well, how are you going to get it to them? That's the distribution channel. How are you going to get, keep, and grow these customers? Customer acquisition, activation, retention, loyalty, et cetera. That's customer relationships. What's the revenue model? Meaning, uh, you know, is it a no licensing business or freemium or something else? And by the way, what's the pricing tactics? That's revenue. And then what are the activities and resources you need to pull this off? And any partners and what are your costs? By the way, this is Oscar Walter's business model camp. I just described the entire strategy of your company in nine simple boxes. Mm -hmm. And what I make everybody do, and it's both in teaching it and, and thinking about it, is write down all your hypotheses. Write them down. And by the way, you use yellow stickies because you're going to be wrong. But write them down. And now, if this was just a class, we'd say, great, you're done. Now go raise some money. Uh, but because it's the real world, we now kind of know that everything you kind of wrote on that business model canvas more than likely wrong, even though you believe right now it's the gospel. And so the second part of the Lean Startup is a methodology for rapidly testing those hypotheses. And that second part is my contribution, a methodology called customer development. And customer development says we're going to get outside the building and rapidly test those hypotheses by actually framing them as experiments, setting up the experiments, running the experiments, getting some data, trying to extract some insight and modifying the hypothesis. And while we're doing that, we're not just doing that in theory, we're going to use the third component of the Lean Startup, which is an agile engineering methodology to build what Eric Riesel labeled the minimum viable products, which in the old days we used to call alpha and beta test prototypes, but now in fact there's going to be no distinction between MVPs because they're going to be an ever-increasing uh, fidelity of prototypes that will get smarter as you get smarter because they're iteratively uh, and incrementally better. And so you're going to be testing MVPs along with your hypotheses about pricing and strategy, et cetera, in front of customers. Uh, and this isn't the only theory. I actually teach this in multiple venues. And, uh, you know, I have students and pretty senior scientists get out of the building and talk to 100 customers and partners within 10 weeks. Big idea. Uh, that this is not some paper exercise you want to play in the Lean Startup game, it's a full contact body sport. And the goal isn't just to collect customer information, the goal is to validate your vision. And I'm happy if, like, hey, you nailed it on day one. It's almost never the case, even though it's not an intellectual argument on day one. You, you obviously believe what you believe because that's what drives the startup. It's an irrational view that you're going to change the world because you have some insight. And all we're doing here is actually adding kind of a, a couple of neurons in the back that has a very rapid hypothesis testing process. And that's what the Lean Startup is. And by the way, I use the word hypothesis um, at Stanford because students pay $50,000 a year. Do I know what the word hypothesis is outside of Stanford? Yes. Guessing, right? You're just effing guessing when you're like <laughs> starting your company. So why don't we have a process that turns those guesses into facts? Yeah. So, that's the lean startup, but I, something yeah, so, question. It's okay. What so, was, so, so, how, so, so, from an investor standpoint, if yeah. how important it is for entrepreneurs right. to do that before meeting with investors? So, think about this. You could, you know, the old days is I'd have an opinion, I'd write up a business plan, summarize the plan in nine slides, and go pitch an investor, which says, "Here's my great idea. Give me money." And, and essentially, that was what the plan was. Is you know, I sat in the library and I did a lot of research and. I got some great market research data from Google or Gartner or somewhere else and put it together in some great pie charts and bar charts and forecasts and if I have some great technology, I'll tell everybody what my technology is and there I am. And by the way, you could still do that today, but imagine you're competing with other entrepreneurs who actually got out of the building and maybe spoke to 50 or 150 customers or partners or whatever and did a venture pitch that went like this. Here's what's my original idea. Now, VCs are kind of looking at their iPhone and playing. Uh, and here's my idea after I spoke to 25 or 35 people. I realized that these assumptions I made about customer segments were wrong, so I pivoted. A pivot is a substantive change to one or more of those business model canvas components, meaning I changed my customer segment or I changed my pricing or I changed whatever, but I changed it based on some data. And now all of a sudden, VCs are kind of glancing up and well, this is kind of interesting. Slide three is, and so as I was going out and building the MVPs, here was the reaction I got from the next set of customers. 
holy cow. Yeah, but we changed the order of the feature set because after those 35 customers, they said it was features 3, 9, and 12 that were really exciting. Now they're putting down their iPhone. Because slide three is, you know, and after we like, you know, pivoted one more time and kind of refined the MVP, uh, we got 9,000 customers. Well, you got my attention. Because you did that under credit card. Because it really didn't cost you much money. Because you didn't like be burning through someone else's cash you are actually iterating, trying to find a uh, kind of a sweet spot. And so imagine that kind of conversation in a venture capital firm in your first pitch versus I got a good idea. Now it doesn't mean that like they're going to agree with your insights uh, uh, you know, from those customers or they're going to agree you were attacking a market that was large enough or that they think you're the right team, etc. I mean, there are all kinds of variables that are going through a VC's head. But now you've kind of eliminated the first we were never able to prove anything about other than they, you know, like what they teach you at Y Combinator Demo Day, great font and loud voice. Um, in, in two minutes, you know, when I've run 400 teams through our incubator, which is the National Science Foundation Innovation Corps, we don't use loud voice and font, we use data and evidence. And, and so I can now, and we actually have some evidence of how well people do out of that stuff. Uh, that yeah, that's perfect, perfect. And you mentioned Y Combinator when he was you first arrived. He was like, "You want to talk about?" No, I don't want to the, talk about <laughs> There's the a little Twitter pissing contest going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. My first one, I feel so proud. <laughs> <laughs> nice, uh, nice. No, so um, uh, Sam Altman, who's now running uh, Y Combinator, you can tweet this <coughs> at SG Plank, um, uh, is putting on I, I think the mother of all classes at Stanford for entrepreneurship. Uh, I mean, there's like, you know, Andreasen and Paul Graham and, you know, I mean, it, it, who's who? And the good news is it's going to be, you know, broadcast live if you can't, if you're not a Stanford student. Uh, though, I, I just kind of object of thinking that you could learn entrepreneurship from things like this. I mean, these are interesting, and classes like Sam is going to offer are great theory, but I've spent too long of a time now as an educator, it's been my second career, to understand that we now know how to teach entrepreneurship, which is very different than how we used to think. We used to think we could sit you in a class, write a business plan, and now you were ready to be an entrepreneur. Excuse me, that's bullshit. Um, entrepreneurship is much like being an artist or brain surgeon. Um, it requires theory and practice. And if all we think is, here are the 10 easy lessons to be an entrepreneur, or sit through more of these things, yeah, that, that's, that's just a simply not true. And so I, I was trying to make a bad point on Twitter, and sometimes 140 <laughs> characters does get in your way, yeah. um, is that, no, it's not there's nothing wrong with those. In fact, you know, those are going to be world-class lectures. It's to think that somehow those will turn you into an entrepreneur. M my data says is that if you're serious about being an entrepreneur, you will have a deep understanding of theory, and the Lean Startup is one more piece of theory that makes us better, but that's just a tool. It's a tool for how to make your practice better. If you think about it, during the Renaissance, 500 years ago, we learned how to teach artists. Right? We learned that art is, number one, a calling, not a job. Mm -hmm. And two is, we learned that while we needed to teach theory, color theory, perspective, etc., being a great artist requires hours, thousands of hours of practice. I'll contend the same is true as entrepreneurship. You might get lucky and nail it on the first time, but for the rest of us, it's just a lot of hard, dirty work. And two is the other thing I'm just kind of biased at is entrepreneurship <laughs> now has the unfortunate trend of being cool. Yeah. Um, and that's also bad, because how many of you have done a startup as a founder? Anyone ever been a founder? Right? This is a shitty job. <laughs> just, you're better off working at goddamn Walmart. I mean, if you really think of the odds, you know, like, why would you do this? And I have to tell you, almost every year, I have a bunch of smart, in Berkeley, I teach in the business school, Stanford and Engineering School, smart MBAs going, Professor Blank, I have a career choice. And I almost could set my watch because I know what it's going to be. What's the choice? I got offered this job by McKinsey. I go, McKinsey, I can't get any better. What's your other choice? Well, me and my roommates are thinking of doing a startup. <laughs> oh, at least some of you. This is isn't laughing. <laughs> Maybe I've got this. Right? I don't know. That's no, no, they're just sucking it all in. They're sucking it. So let me talk to you guys. Uh, so, or maybe because the seats are empty. So the, uh, why it's funny 
is there's no possible way you could hold McKinsey and a startup in your head at the same time. Yeah. McKinsey is the world's best job. Right? It's a job, but it's a great job. A startup is a calling. It's a calling. It's a call from God. If you don't have that passion inside of you that you need to create something, I don't mean being an early employee or being an employee. I mean as a founder of a company, if you're not called to this thing, stay away until you are. Because you're going to be the facilities person when the toilet stops up at 3 in the morning and floods the building. You're going to be the one holding the bag when your co-founder leaves, and just about as you were going to close the round. You're going to be there when your best customer decides that you know they're going with a competitor. You know, it's a pretty nice, and some of you are going, yeah, that just happens to me all the time. Well, it does. It, like, I remember being the start with, like, my chief operating officer going, well, are there any more wheels to fall off this week? I mean, I remember how miserable this one was. Um, and so the thing that drives you past that misery is because you still see that vision. You're driven for creating something that just doesn't exist, and these are just obstacles. You will move around you. If it's a job, the first time that, excuse me, the stuff hits the fan, you're going to go, what do I need this crap for? And I'm like, go get a job. Yeah. So that's to me, is the distinction between, and, and maybe that's old school, but I think that's, it, it, it's not that I don't mind that entrepreneurship is popular and now whatever, it just makes a bigger pool of people who are called. But we don't confuse this with artists, right? We don't split the room and say, you guys over here, uh, you're going to work on a manufacturing line. And you guys over here are going to be composers and painters. And we know that's not possible. We know that you know some people are called to, to recognizing early that they want to create. The other thing we've also recognized, which is back to the Stanford uh -huh. class, is we've also recognized, I think about the 19th century, that we ought to teach art appreciation as early as possible. Hmm. And the reason why is we've recognized that when you're young, you might have these feelings inside about creation, but you don't even know how to give them voice. You know, meaning, gee, I like to write or I like to paint. Is there a job like that? And, and all of a sudden, you find out, why well, yes, you can be a composer or musician or whatever, and that's considered your passion could actually be a career. Teaching entrepreneurial education widely and as young as possible is exactly the same value is we should teach entrepreneurship education in, the, in every community we could, in fact, build up. We were having this conversation to know that it's a possibility that not only can you enjoy your passion, in our case, you know, you could get rich off of it, which is a, but it's a second order effect, right? Getting rich has never been the goal of great entrepreneurs. It's been making your passion happen. Yeah, totally, totally. I want to go back to the passion a little bit from the previous conversation, um, but I want to ask this question first. Because uh, now you say the founder, they decided they have the passion. It's, it's in the call, it's their calling. And you wrote a recent article why you feel like you know uh, founders must learn how to cope. They should know how to cope. And there's a debate back and forth that some people argue in terms of, oh, well, Kevin Rose, he he you know he didn't build dig, he didn't build his recent right, startup now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's all these stories, like right? So so you know, you elaborate on that and why you feel like founders of mobile are uh, wrong. Yeah. <laughs> can make uh, a story out of all the corner cases. And, and so, you know, anytime you want to negate an argument, you bring up a corner case and we could spend, you know, hours arguing. I don't think there's much argument. I mean, it's just, in fact, intellectually, you could just decompose the argument. If you want to be a founder of something that requires some domain-specific knowledge and you want to be the CEO, you, in fact, now lodge, you now lack domain judgment. How do I find a technical co-founder? How do I, in fact, judge whether you know, what my VP of engineering just told me is a, you know, three-year job. Is it, was he right or was he wrong? Not that thinking a coding class is going to make you an expert and an architectural police. You know, I'm not making those claims. But it's like not even knowing English, you know. To me, in a certain class of applications, web and mobile specifically, I was writing about having the founding CEO not have her ever taking the programming class, I think just dramatically decreases the odds. Period. End of discussion. It's so like being in a hardware company and you, you know, don't know any hardware, or, you know, or don't know any anything about computer architecture. Yes, you could do that, but then you're kind of acting like the suit. You know, the guy in the Dilbert cartoon. You know, like, you know, Dilbert's always screwing with his head. That's kind of the role you're in. By the way, the whole lean startup process actually is a way, as an aside, 
to teach founders and demystify sales, marketing, biz dev, and finance without ever once using those words. If you get out of the building and you're testing hypotheses, congratulations. At least if you go through the, the, the version as I teach it in, in these classes, you will never be bullshitted by a VP of sales or marketing again in your life. Because you have done that job by bringing in the first orders and then you go, okay, I know, you know, I, I found a repeatable process and I'm gonna hire a professional. So the idea is as a founding CEO, I have kind of a, a, an opinion about the domain expertise you need to have. Yeah. That's yeah. what it is. Um, I like your argument, <laughs> I like your argument. So we build up, we focus on three areas, global impact, innovation, and inclusion. I want to talk about the third one, inclusion. Uh, one of the questions we get asked is like, well, Wayne, how did you connect to Steve Blank? You know, or does Steve Blank care about inclusion or diversity nah. and so forth? And so, Tell me there was free food out <laughs> It was cool. So what are your thoughts about that? Because a lot of conversation around that, you know, Google and other companies put out their, 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 their numbers around diversity and so forth. So, yeah, they kind of suck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, um, you know, maybe the easiest one for me to answer is why do I care? And uh, you know, I kind of remember what my roots are. My parents were immigrants to the United States. Uh, you know, I grew up in a 600-square-foot apartment in New York. And my parents uh, worked in sweatshops in New York before they achieved their dream, which was running a grocery store, which barely fed the family. Uh, and then eventually lost the grocery store. Uh, and, uh, and for me, when I came out to Silicon Valley, uh, you know, was finding a place where you could actually get paid for what you did. And um, it, at least for me at the time, it seemed to be people really didn't care whether you went to school or where you went to school or who you were or whatever. It's like, you know, were you smart and good and would you work, you know, and sleep in, under the desk, which I did. Um, and, and so, you know, I kind of thought this was a path for hope and we had this conversation. You know, I think one of the, one of the great things about this country is um, we provide paths for hope for multiple communities and multiple times and um, yet we seem to be limited you know limiting the, the the communities we've been addressing and when I came out I was mentioning to when I came out to Silicon Valley venture capital was a white boys club I mean you know when you saw the new coast club people would like take pictures you know there was like <laughs> and there was kind of a glass ceiling where if you were Asian let alone Indian well, you might aspire to be the VP of engineering, but no one was going to fund a Asian CEO. I hope you're all giggle about that now. I mean, like, you know, half of the CEOs in, in Silicon Valley. And, and so I think we made the pool larger, um, and this is what the country is great at, but I think there's still a bigger pool, and I don't think there's any reason why we shouldn't include everybody. Um, plus, I think the Valley provides an alternative for uh, communities. Um, where there was no path out and there was you know limited paths of hope. I like to think that you can now, you know, there's a choice gets a lot broader in, in, in communities of color that says, oh wait a minute, you know, I could be like Wayne, you know, or I, I could be like other people and, and look at that, there are people just like me who are at Google or Facebook or Twitter. I, I want to do that. And I think there's nothing more exciting about this country is, is that we provide the opportunities to do that. We sometimes make it harder for individual communities, but um, I think we kind of get in the message that we need to make the the, the kind of the game a little larger and, and why. I agree. I agree. We haven't done this before. I'm going to fist bump you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you. I mean, why wouldn't we want to do that? Um, you know, the valley is, I mean, look around you. You know, we're, we're getting pretty good at this. I don't think we're perfect at all, but I think we should have a goal that says, Man, you know, Silicon Valley should be a place that everyone in the country aspires to. That we all should want to be here, and, and we want to do it because we're passion driven, but kind of in a back of our head, and you could be fucking rich at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize that until Startup Six, I gotta tell you. I was so <laughs> dumb. I remember driving down 101 thinking maybe this was the day they were gonna make me to pay to work there. Because I couldn't believe it. I was getting a salary and doing the stuff I love to do. And then Startup 6, I went, maybe I should actually be asking for more equity, because they kept giving me these pieces of paper. At first, they started turning into like cars, and then they turned into houses, and then they turned into bigger things. I went, all right, I'm going to ask for more of this stuff. But I wasn't doing it for the money. Uh, but I think this combination of being able to find that there's a place 
where you're measured by your competence, your skill, your hustle, you know, your vision, your whatever, that's a very American thing. Yeah, I and, and, and I think this country is great at that. And with all due respect, this valley uh, has maybe the, the best opportunity to do that. Of maybe second to, I, I, I hate to say it, but you know, I grew up in the military, and the military was actually a place that was kind of like that, where, man, all we cared about is like how competent were you. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's the, you know, the criteria here is how competent, and by the way, if I'm a venture capitalist, how much money can I make off of you? Yeah. Right? And okay. Uh, we're also talking, I grew up in New York and also came from a military background, and I thought I, uh, I had two advantages. New Yorkers kind of grow up with sharp elbows. Um, you know, never waiting in line, at least the part of New York I grew up in, it was like, line, you know, what, what, car, that belongs to you, well, it used to belong to you, now it belongs to me. Um, um, and the other is, uh, I came out of the military in Vietnam, and the story I'd like to tell is that I, I came out here in Silicon Valley, and it was my first company, it was a startup, and I remember housemates in Palo Alto going, wow, what if the company goes out of business, you could, like, be out of a job, and, you know, isn't that risky? I still remember to this day going, I just came from a place where risk meant you could die on the job. <laughs> <laughs> so, can you die? You know, the, is there something I don't understand? And so there was an impedance mismatch yeah. between expectations of what failure meant here and failure in a war zone, which is why, you know, uh, first and lieutenants and captains of combat in Iraq and Afghanistan, if any of you ever get a chance to hire them, uh, these are people who are spectacular in bringing order out of chaos in a scale that you cannot imagine if you've never been in combat. Um, and, and so this combination of New Yorker elbows and coming from a place where, you know, risk had a different, I think gave me a competitive edge. And, and to be honest, you know, we've been having this conversation, yeah. I think I, I think that we could find great entrepreneurs from the hood who've been hustling, <laughs> no, who've been hustling kind of, you know, their whole lives, you know, they're gonna kick your ass from here to something, you know, like, be aware. because. You know, I had about 2% of that, but I've seen some real hustlers who know, know what to do. Now combine that with, man, they're great at STEM education, you know, they're great at science and they're great at entrepreneurship. That's going to be, I think, the next wave of entrepreneurs, if we could capture them early and actually give them a pathway to Silicon Valley. Again, this is going to be one hell of a ride. We ain't seen anything yet in the Valley, which is, which is kind of like... Why well, I think what you guys are doing are God's work here. Yeah. Uh, well, now that we're going to make a show a lot of money too. <laughs> <laughs> um, because if we're right, by the way, we'll, uh, yeah, we, apologies we, for the riff, but if we're right, VCs are now going to be looking for, man, like, wow, that guy just kicked ass to get here. We just imagine what he could do or a woman to, to just get to this place. And I've seen that with students from foreign countries who have uh, come from small some small village in India or China who, you know, like made their lives different and better by you know either you know figuring out how to go to big schools from some rural area and then make it over to the U.S. and then start to I mean that is like a, kind of a, a hustle factor just to like make it here and it actually kind of is a filter because the ones who couldn't make it didn't show up here and so we're now all raising the game and I think that's gonna we ain't seen anything yet and it's and and it's fundamentally American. Because this, here's why. I, I blow away my foreign visitors all the time. I ask them, do they know what we call a failed entrepreneur in Silicon Valley? Mm. You know what the word is for a failed entrepreneur? Experience. <laughs> it's a big idea. It's in fact, that definition is the definition of an entrepreneurial cluster. It doesn't happen everywhere in the US, but in fact, after you've blown $35 million, like I did once, do you know what the first question is your, your best friend will ask you after you've like get out of bed depressed, what's your next start? Yeah. Instead of, did you have to change your name or are you leaving the <laughs> or are they somebody coming after you with a baseball bat, etc. Why we're good here is not only we're smart, but we get multiple shots at the goal. Right. Failure does not mean you're done here. Now, after three or four times, VCs don't return their calls. But you know, <laughs> my, yeah. my favorite story is uh, my second to last company cover of Wired magazine, it was a video game company, you know, hot stuff, and blah, blah, blah. 90 days after being on the cover of Wired, I realized we're going out of business. Not good. <laughs> uh, and we do go out of business, sold the piece parts to Sega. You know, I could claim it didn't hit the ground underneath, but it truly hit the ground. 
I called up my mother, Russian immigrant, English is their first language, there was always a pause in translation. Mom, calling you, hey, how are you doing? Well, I thought I'd let you know I just lost $35 million. No. Pause, translate. Oh, where'd you put it? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, wow, it's like God, you know, like spend our, uh, and then she broke into languages I didn't even recognize, Russian and Polish and Yiddish and, you know, I didn't even know she was Finnish. I mean, it was like, the words I was hearing about. And most of it, finally, when she got back into English, she went, oh my God, the country we came from is gone. There's nowhere for us to go. And then the second one is that she was thinking, and her name is blank, we can't even change it. You know? <laughs> and the punchline was, I said, Mom, no, uh, the reason I'm calling you now is like my, my, my mother never thought I had a job until I actually started teaching at Stanford and then she could tell her friends. I said, where'd you think the money was coming from? I didn't know, but I didn't want to tell our friends. You know? <laughs> I said, Mom, the reason I'm calling you is the VCs who lost the money just gave me another $12 million. And like, you could just hear, you know? And then she broke into, you know, like Polish and said, you know, they told us the streets were paved with, with gold in the United States. I guess it is. And the punchline is I turned that 12 million bucks into a billion dollars each for the investors who gave it to me. And, and that's a story of failure and redemption. I mean, rocket science failure was pretty miserable, pretty public, pretty whatever. But you know what? After the, you know, the morning period of like, I said, I mean, I'm not depressed. My wife said, Steve, you're going to bed at 4 p.m. every day. I think you are. You recover from, <laughs> recover from depression. And after I did, I just got up and did another one, and yeah. that's what the valley's about. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, you bring up depression. Yeah. It's very real. And in, I don't think it's talked about enough in Silicon Valley and in tech, especially for all the entrepreneurs who come out with that passion, but then it, they may fail. Some don't recover. And, uh, you shouldn't I, be in the game. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I personally believe that we need to rethink entrepreneurship in terms of cognitive awareness, empathy, things that that narrative. Uh, what do you see that level playing in entrepreneurship? Because it's very real. So, uh, you know, this is when I went back to, you know, entrepreneurs are closer to artists. You mm -hmm. know, there's more suicides and... and, and behavior issues with mm -hmm. artists, only because their brain chemistry is kind of wired a little different. There's enough data to kind of recognize that that's true. Uh, with all due respect, I think I disagree on we should kind of lighten up. I don't think so. I, I think it's in fact, it, it's how hard this is, is what makes it great. But I think there's a different line, and it was the one I had to learn, which is this family life, you know, startup balance, which is different from let's lighten up in the job, it, this is all consuming. If you do it right, it's a 24-7, in fact, you somehow managed to make it a 25-8 game. I mean, it will take over your entire life, and you will never get a memo from your VCs or investors that says, don't work this hard. That's a big idea. And, and not understanding that cost me my first marriage in Silicon Valley. And when I got married a second time, luckily my wife had been the second evangelist at Apple, and it, you know, actually gone and been through her second startup and set down some rules, which was, hey, here's how we're going to play the game. You are going to be home at 7 p.m. for dinner with our kids. She never told me for years that she was actually feeding them at 5. So they were <laughs> much smarter than I would. And here, and we were having a date night every week, and you will, you know, be, be spending weekends with our kids and our family, and we were taking three-week vacations at whoa. And I was doing the startups. And that was actually harder than anything I had ever done, was finding that what that personal life work balance. Yeah. So I would think less than, than let's um, lighten up on the, uh, on the startup. I think figuring out how to get balance between whether you're married or not, or a um, relation, figuring out how to get that life balance in, I think will solve some of that I'm alone when I fail thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the saddest thing in Silicon Valley is having an entrepreneur who just made a hundred million bucks in an empty house because his wife and kids just left, mm, right? right? That's in fact, you know, the saddest story. Or just being alone and not having any relationships, you know, when you're 50 and you made a ton of money and like, you don't, you don't have any, any of that stuff. And I learned this painfully by some of my mentors, um, mm -hmm. spectacular people whose names you would know from the industry. I watched them because we had kids late in life. I had my first child at 38. Um, so I got to watch a lot of them have their kids who grew up hating their parents because they were never home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm a slow learner, but I saw enough of this to go, you know, there's no undo button here. 
you don't get to make it up later. Um, you know, and so what would be the best thing I could have is like a tombstone that said he never missed a meeting or a tombstone that said he was a great father. Um, and that was kind of like, you know, I had to think about that a lot and luckily I had a partner that like reminded me that was the deal. Um, but truly, you don't get that memo. So I, I would change the variant a bit mm -hmm. to say this balance stuff is something we talk about even less, about whether it's girlfriends, boyfriends, partners, significant others, etc. And man, when you can push that and we're having kids button, boy, you better make sure like you have figured out how to play this game because you don't get to make that up. And yeah. I have to tell you, the thing I'm most proud of is not the startups. And my daughters, who are now in my 20s, can't think of a better thing to do on holidays than come home and spend it with their parents. Well, you know, we'll blame them that they want to see my wife, but still, <laughs> it's because of like they, you know, they want to see me, yeah. and, and that was hard. Yeah. Um, so I'm sorry for the. No, no, it's great, great, uh, yeah, great, great feedback, great feedback. I want to ask one more question about innovation, and then um, go to Q and A. Sure. And uh, so we live in a time now where you know, 3D print is on the rise, talks of nanotechnology, Apple with Google Pay, NFCs, you know. So it's, and we six years away from 2020. You know, like when I was a kid, a person was a kid, like 2020, flying cars, all this thing. When I was a kid, 1980, was a <laughs> 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 like, 20th, 21st century was like. Yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. Yeah. Uh, we're not that far apart. <laughs> so, um, where do you think we are in terms of innovation? Could, should we be further along or? or you Even if I knew that, I'd be running a hedge fund. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, the answer is I, I think everybody in this room is going to be inventing what the future is. You know, um, you know, you read people bitching about where's their flying cars and where's their whatever. You know, screw you guys. Go invent it. I mean, Elon Musk did. I mean, that's to me the, the probably the canonical example of now what Silicon Valley still is. Is where's the DNA in Silicon Valley? Here's a guy who said screw social media. Sorry about sitting saying that's sitting in Google, but I want to go to Mars and I want to like reinvent the auto industry. Stop a bitch, you pulled it off. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, but if you don't know, SpaceX just got $2.6 billion to do the, yeah. along with Boeing, to do the manned uh, uh, yeah. uh, Dragon capsule to, the, uh, to space. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and, you know, Tesla's uh, just crossed 50,000 cars uh, produced so far. They'll knock off 35,000 yeah. this year and more. Uh, and they're panicking, the automobile manufacturers, because the guy saw something that no one else did. Uh, you know, the general wisdom, and I think we now know this about innovation and entrepreneurship, is everybody else is doing it, you're probably too late mm -hmm. to be disruptive. It doesn't mean you can't make a nice company and don't, it's not my advice is to don't go do it. But if, if you're not inventing the future, then you shouldn't be asking about what the future is. You should go just be it. reading the newspaper. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, totally. totally. Um, I, uh, I just think, though, this valley, and maybe three or four other places in the world, but still the valley, you know, the moniker is Silicon Valley, but, you know, that's not just what we do anymore. We really, from San Jose to San Francisco, probably is the center of innovation and entrepreneurship for the world. For the world. It's an amazing time. I mean, it was an amazing time when I came out here in the 70s, but it's even better. We constantly reinvent ourselves. And, you know, Fred Turbin, who basically was the guy who engineered the valley by accident, the professor at Stanford, uh, believed this was going to be microwave valley. Hmm. And, you know, Noyce and Moore believed it was going to be Silicon Valley. And, you know, Andreessen and, you know, company believed it was going to be, you know, web application valley. And Google believes it's, you know, social media valley. But we're not done yet. We have, you know, we are great at just making innovation. We are now a company town. We are what Rome was or Florence or London or Paris for for the center of the universe for this stuff. And there are other places that it's not. Beijing for social media is pretty unbelievable. And, you know, San Diego still does a good job of, of uh, life sciences. And, uh, and New York has emerged. And by the way, one guy engineered that as a cluster, who is Bloomberg, uh, uh, has emerged as a, another startup capital, surprisingly, and still keeping media and finance going. But this is the place. Uh, and you are the people to do it. And that's exciting. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. And uh, let's give Steve a hand. Great.